Good afternoon, this is Dr. Lewis Blevins, Pituitary World News. Today we're at the University of California, San Francisco. We're here today to talk to Dr. Manish Aghi. Dr. Aghi is a neurosurgeon who is an associate professor of neurological surgery at University of California, San Francisco. His focus is on pituitary disorders. He is also an endoscopic surgeon and the head of the Skull Basin Endoscopic Program at UCSF. Manish, thanks for joining us today to talk about headaches in patients with pituitary disorders. We really appreciate your time. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. So, headaches are very common uh, in the general population. I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about the incidence, frequency, and the different types of headaches that a, a routine physician might see in his or her practice. Absolutely. Uh, the quoted incidence or prevalence of headaches in the general population varies quite a bit depending on which reference you go to. It ranges anywhere from 20 to 70 percent, uh, but I like to say that on average about 50 percent of us will report having had some significant experience with headaches during our lifetimes. And what are some of the different causes? The most common causes of headaches are migraines, um, which is really a uh, debilitating uh, problem in the population in general, particularly younger women. Um, it is very challenging to differentiate a migraine from a non-migranous headache, but some of the features that tend to lead you to think about migraines would be an orwa or a feeling uh, of a strange visual sensation or sometimes even a strange smell sensation occurring right before or during the headache. Now it's true that some women have more headaches during their menstrual period and they might be related to estrogens. Uh, what about men with testosterone? Is there any data? The data for men with testosterone is not great. There are references in which uh, testosterone deficient men can complain of headaches, but it's not consistent enough to say whether it's causally related or coincidental. So I think the biggest concern that most people have when they have a headache is, do I have a tumor? So could you talk about headaches and brain tumors and then also uh, focus a little bit on uh, the uh, types of patients or, t or types of headaches that would prompt uh, the performance of an MRI scan? Absolutely. Uh, a headache from a brain tumor is in, uh, typically felt to reflect some sort of elevation in intracranial pressure. The brain itself feels no innervation, but the dura, the covering of the brain, is well innervated and felt to be the source of many headaches. Um, intracranial pressure headaches from a mass within the brain um, have classically been described as being worse in the morning because when we wake up in the morning from having slept, our uh, uh, breathing patterns are such that um, that's when we're going to be most susceptible to elevated intracranial pressure and pressure-associated headaches. So morning headaches and then uh, changes in pattern of headaches, would that prompt an MRI consideration? Abs absolutely. Morning headaches, changes in pattern, and sometimes just the severity alone is enough for a medical provider to order an MRI. So patients who are having headaches more common and more severe. Correct. Uh, and I think it's important to keep those distinctions in mind just because so many people do have headaches in the first place. Absolutely. It, it has to be some sort of change in background. If there's someone who's been having headaches for many years without a change, then the odds of intracranial pathology are pretty low because it would have progressed over time if that were the case. So we recently saw a patient who had had headaches for about two years and uh, they became more acutely severe and he presented to the emergency room and was found to have a large pituitary tumor. So could you talk a little bit about headaches in patients who have pituitary tumors as far as what might be the causes and how they might present the certain symptoms and signs and location, etc.? Uh, absolutely. So the, the prevailing hypothesis would be that somehow the, the dura would be um, stretched in some way because that's the only innervated structure within the vicinity of the cella. So the, the dura covering the cella or supercellar space, if there were a mass causing it to bulge out, um, the patient might report headache. Interestingly, despite the fact that it's very focal down in the cella, um, the patient's 
describe their headaches with a variety of locations. Some will say it comes from the vertex or the top of their head. Others will say it's a temporal or the side of the head and others will describe a classic frontal or forehead type location. So we found that the location can vary quite a bit. Um, but the, the feeling is that it's from pressure innervation of the dura caused by elevated intracellular pressure. So you have recently completed a research study and presented results at a national meeting and also written a paper on headaches in patients with pituitary tumors and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your findings if we may. Yes, absolutely. The, the results of our work were presented at the American Association of Neurological Surgeons annual meeting and it was given the Synthes Award for Best Skull Base Abstract and the paper is currently uh, being reviewed. We analyzed 1,015 patients uh, treated at the California Center for Pituitary Disorders over about a five-year period, um, all of whom underwent surgery. And of those patients, 329 described a preoperative headache. On average, the duration of the headache was six months, and but it ranged quite a bit from hours to decades of the duration of headache. The locations were quite variable from frontal, temporal, um, retroorbital, and uh, the incidence of headaches, as I mentioned, was about 33%, which is a little lower than uh, other series I've reported. Um, but interestingly, it varied a lot by pathology. The, the most frequent patients with headaches were those with Rathke's cleft cysts. About two out of three of them had headaches. Uh, in contrast, our non-functional pituitary adenoma population, only about 29% of them had headaches. This was all retrospective, so we were looking back in the charts, and that's obviously subject to um, some limitations in that regard. But we then asked uh, the most significant question that we were interested in, which is, well, first of all, what types of patients had headaches? So I mentioned that the patients with Rathke's cleft cyst pathology were more likely to have headaches, and it was also younger patients and female patients that had a higher incidence of headaches. In fact, the age correlation was very striking. If you looked at the decade of life, so less than 20 years old, 20, and patients in their 20s, patients in their 30s, all the way out to patients in their 80s, it was a linear relationship. So below age 20, about 62% of the patients had a headache, and then you get down into their 80s and only 30% of those patients had headaches, and it was a linear relationship that descended like that. So that was an interesting finding. We then asked what were the factors that were associated with post-operative improvement in headaches. Well, the first thing we noted is that at the six-week follow-up, only about 15% of the patients who started with a headache reported improvement. But at the six-month follow-up, it was 50%. So that's an important message for our patients, which is that if you have surgery and you have a headache, it's going to take a little bit of time to get better. At six weeks, patients are often dealing with low-grade pain associated with surgical recovery. So it's very premature to judge recovery at six weeks. But at six months, you get the sense that about 50% of patients get better. And we counsel our patients about that. But that's still better than, than you might have guessed. There's a number of providers who would see a patient with a pituitary tumor and a headache and say, oh, there's no way this is related. And, and we found a variety of, uh, across a variety of pathologies that it is about 50%. There were two other factors that were associated with improvement. One was complete removal of the tumor. And that makes sense because if this is due to elevated pressure, the best way to, for the patient to get better is to completely eliminate the pressure source by taking out the tumor. If you take out only half of a tumor that's 2.5 centimeters with elevated pressure, by the time all the scarring occurs around the residual tumor, you may not have cured the elevated pressure that the patient started out with. But if you can remove the tumor completely and leave behind a, a fluid-filled space with a little bit of fat graft that slowly disintegrates, the pressure in six months should be down to normal, if not lower. And that's an important variable. The second variable we noticed is that the longer the patient had been complaining of a headache prior to surgery, uh, the less likely they were to get improvement with surgery. Now, it, interestingly, there was no cutoff beyond which it was impossible to get better. So even patients who reported two years of headaches could have some improvement with surgery. It was just that the um, lower the duration, the better the odds of improvement. And I think these factors point to getting you know, good care at a tertiary care center and timely care at a specialized center of expertise to give you the best chance of headache improvement when you have headaches potentially associated with a cellar lesion. So we see a lot of patients who 
have been told that their headaches aren't related to their pituitary tumors, and clearly that's not the case with a 50% improvement in patients by six months. Absolutely. Now, there are caveats. Um, the, uh, the headache population in general is prone to you know, a placebo effect, and this is particularly true with surgeries. There's papers out there where they do sham surgeries for migraine patients, uh, where they inject saline into the scalp and the patient feels better. But at the same time, you know, with that caveat in mind, I would argue that uh, our data suggests that um, it is highly likely that headaches are, are attributable to many types of cellular lesions in general. And do you find headache as an indication then to proceed with surgery in a patient who has a pituitary lesion? I do. I think our data supports that. And of course, as with any surgical operation, you need to counsel the patient as to the risks and benefits. So if headache is the only thing that they're complaining of, then the potential benefit is, as I said, a 50% chance of improvement. But of course, there's risks with surgery. There's risks of diabetes insipidus, meningitis, et cetera. But at our practice, um, those risks are well below 50%. In fact, they're well below 1%. So in weighing the risks benefits, if I see a patient with a lesion that looks um, capable of causing headaches, i.e. more than a few millimeters in size, then uh, I would certainly consider surgery in that patient. All right, well, that's been extremely informative, and I really appreciate you meeting with us today. Thank you for the opportunity.